So welcome everybody to our coffee break with the Saskatoon Council on Aging. My name is June Gowden and I'll be your MC for today. I really hope you enjoy the conversation today with Dr. Megan O'Connell about how important it is to take care of our mental health as well as our physical health. For guests who may be new to the Saskatoon Council on Aging, I'm just going to highlight a little bit of information about us. We have a resource center that provides information referrals, pamphlet resources, and we have free monthly social programs such as the Seniors Neighborhood Hub Club, lifelong learning programs, telephone buddy program, Seniors Mastering Technology program. We have a century club for adults that are 90 years and older. And we have a Globe Walk program that helps keep individuals motivated during those winter months by forming teams and staying active. We also have a free directory of services and activities for older adults. And we have monthly newsletters to keep you informed about all our activities. We have a caregiver information and support service, which is the only one in the province. And we identify and act on unmet needs of older adults. We support older adults to lead healthy, independent lives, to be social and active and socially engaged. You can phone us at any time at our office at 652-2255, excuse me, <clears throat> to find out more information. If you have questions during this webinar, please click on your chat icon and put them in there and our moderator will be looking at those throughout the presentation. There are also students available today through the university to help you get technical support should you need it at 306-966-2496. Now I'd like to welcome our moderator for today, Shan Landry. Shan is a lifelong member of the Saskatoon community and she is committed to improving the quality of life of all. Shan has worked for 34 years at the Saskatoon Health Region, now called the Saskatchewan Health Authority. Shan is passionate about the determinants of health and working with others to create a system and a community that sponsors and supports the mind, body, and spirit. In her retirement, Shan has, is serving on the board of the Saskatoon Council on Aging as chair. She has served in the past on our board, and she also continues to volunteer on our Age-Friendly Community Development Committee. So welcome, Shan, and she's going to take it from here. Well, thanks very much, June, and uh, it's a pleasure for me to be here today um, and to welcome everybody. And you touched on it right at the beginning, June, but this is meant to be a coffee chat. And as much as I would like to be drinking my coffee, I will refrain as moderator just in case I move my hands about and knock it over. But I hope that those of you who are listening are settling back and are going to listen and also participate with your questions. As June said, you can chat, put them in the chat line and I'll see them as they pop up. I had planned to do um, a little bit more of a conversation with our guest just to start off with and then I'll start peppering her with questions and also look at some of the questions that are coming in from all of you. But of course, the first pleasure I have is to introduce our guest, uh, Dr. Megan O'Connell. Welcome, Megan. Uh, Dr. O'Connell received her PhD from the University of Victoria Clinical Psychology Program, Neuropsychology Emphasis. She researches issues in assessment and intervention for dementia, mild cognitive impairment, and cognitive aging. She is a professor in the graduate program in clinical psychology at the University of Saskatchewan. She practices in the interdisciplinary diagnostic memory clinic, rural and remote memory clinic. She co-leads Team 15 in the Canadian Consortium on Neurodegeneration in Aging, where she leads newly developed rural and remote memory clinic interventions for Saskatchewan residents. The rural and remote memory clinic involves behavioral and psychological interventions tailored to, to people with cognitive impairment or dementia and their caregivers. 
Interventions are done by telehealth, internet, video conferencing to ensure accessibility for rural families. Since March, she has been working with SCOA to support older adults in the use of video conferencing or other technologies to maintain social connections. So I say welcome, and also I'm going to use a familiar name for you, which is Megan, rather than Dr. O'Connell. I feel we've been working with you, uh, Dr. O'Connell, uh, for uh, almost a year now. So um, I feel like we have a friendship level that would entitle me to use your first name. I hope that's okay. Of course, yeah. <laughs> it's funny, I, I don't tend to use my title. Uh, I suspected <laughs> not, and it seems a little foreign. So yeah. welcome, Megan. Mm -hmm. And I thought I would just start out um, by touching on, you know, the very subject of our, our talk today is mental health in older adults. And I know you've been practicing in the field for a very long time, but certainly over the last year with the pandemic, I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about whether you've noticed changes, impacts, some differences that in comparison with say four years ago, things that you would be seeing in your practice now that you would not have seen prior to the pandemic, just to get us started on the environment right now. Sure, so most of my practice is with people who have concerns about cognitive impairment or dementia. Um, and I'm certainly seeing <laughs> profound impacts for people who are living in any sort of community residence setting, whether that's like um, uh, or a home for older adults, for instance, they're because of the pandemic. So obviously we've all heard about long-term care. So that's residential care for people who have concerns. So, but this problem of access to people and ability to uh, have autonomy in who you hang out with and how you hang out with them is not unique to long-term care, unfortunately. And any older adult I've been working with who is in these uh, communities, they are experiencing and have experienced due to the pandemic, some profound loss of social uh, engagement. And the social engagement we'll talk about, I think maybe some later, is so important. It's one of the most cognitively stimulating things we do. So we're seeing people in a, you know, <laughs> whose dementia is accelerated. Mm -hmm. So it's quite profound. Um, so people who I might have expected to see some more mild kind of problems, I'm now seeing quite accelerated decline. In. And we did some uh, analyses of stories of experience of people with dementia and COVID. And, and this fits with my clinical experience. We're seeing a lot of people who had problems, and again, I'm not talking about cognitively healthy older adults, I'm talking about people the, where I tend to deal with them, who have problems that are profoundly accelerated. And it's all because they can no longer visit family. They can't socialize, they can't have communal. Right. So right. this lack of stimulation has had a profound impact. And I believe that we will, as research comes out post pandemic, again, it'll just show this what I'm seeing clinically as well. Okay, and it certainly hits home for me with some of the individuals I've talked to who have um, someone they love in long-term care and they haven't been able to see them. And their biggest worry is that while the, the resident knew them beforehand, now with long periods of absence, they go in and now their family member doesn't recognize them anymore because there's been so, so much time without. So that would be an example, would it, of somebody whose decline goes faster yeah. because they're so isolated. Yeah. And some of our analyses of stories. So we actually use Twitter, believe it or not, just to be able to get access to things really quickly because things move so fast in the pandemic. Our analysis of stories have, have an anecdotal, obviously, but um, people who describe a person living with dementia who doesn't understand why their family's not coming. They don't understand the pandemic. And this is, again, not mm -hmm. normal cognitive changes. This is dementia. And they stop eating Right, right. So it can have some effect on their physical well-being as well, right? Yeah. yeah. Okay. We'll, we'll talk about that. The physical and the co and the cognitive and the psychological are so linked. Okay, I, I do want to get into that, <laughs> yeah. but I have a, a couple of questions I want to ask you first. One of them is that 
we entitled this discussion about mental health and people yeah. often refer to the big area of, of well-being as mental health but then sometimes it gets used interchangeably with the term mental illness people who have a clinical diagnosis and i wondered if you could just talk a little bit about the subtlety of difference or maybe it's not so subtle yeah and let me add a third term <laughs> Mental okay. wellness okay. is a bigger term, yeah. Um, so yeah, so mental illness is is a reserve term for when we diagnose a clinical mental health disorder. And the main distinction between um, like a normal mental health challenge, let's talk about, for instance, um, maybe you have, theoretically, not you personally, uh, symptoms mm -hmm. of depression, say, um, just a little bit of sad mood a little bit, but then all of a sudden, like the people I've been seeing, you have absolutely no social ice, social connections, um, only to get to talk to your family over the telephone because you don't have other infrastructure, and that low mood that you had every once in a while is now making it really hard to get out of bed, and it's not something that's a few hours a day, it's all day, every day. So that is uh, a, a, um, one of the Sorry. examples of where something that is a mental health thing, a little bit of depression, becomes a mental illness. So there's a threshold at which we diagnose things clinically. Okay. And in some ways it's kind of arbitrary because you, know, you can still have concerns with depression, but not have a major depressive episode, which is what mm -hmm. that mental mm -hmm. illnesses. Well, I, and, and you're right. I mean, I'm a person who's usually fairly cheerful and up uh, an upbeat, but during the pandemic, there have been times, days when I feel really quite blue and in a funk. Yeah. But to me, that's more of a mental health challenge than it is that I'm not quite descended into that constant kind of sense of depression. Yeah, and that's the main, um, the main distinction between kind of mental health, which we all, I mean, we have we have mental worlds so we all have some challenges um and an illness is does it impact your ability to function either in your occupation your social environment or or scholastic or work in you know other environments and if right. it impacts that and you know it's severe enough and it's been impacting it long enough then every mental illness has its own like little which one how much and what symptoms you have to have but the commonality is it has to impact you you can't be fun you can't function like you used to and that's when it turns into a mental illness versus general mental health but right. i'd also like to talk about mental wellness which is kind of a new okay yeah please, please yeah. jump in yeah because mental wellness you know we used to think about it, mental health and we just kind of talked about it and now we think a bit more broadly sometimes and we think about the positive sides. So psychology has been criticized for focusing on mental health and mental illness and psychopathology was the technical term for mental illness. Um, but we haven't been focusing enough on mental wellness, like what to do to make yourself like help happier during the day and these kind of things. So that's newer for us. And I think that's another area to think about is beyond mental health or, or mental health concerns. The example even I gave was about, you know, depression. But what about happiness? Right? <laughs> you know, yeah. That's equally as important, right? And that's where um, we're trying to think a bit more about mental wellness and, and those positive sides a bit more as well in psychology. In general, okay. everyone, but I'd say okay. we're right to the game, yeah. Okay. And one other foundational question as we go along, your area of specialty in mental health is with cognitive decline, dementia, but there's most people tend to think if they're being the least bit ageist or they don't know much about aging that all of us will develop some sort of dementia the older we grow and i just wondered if you could talk <laughs> about the percentages or the incidence of this because i'm assuming that i know lots of very old people who are not demented and don't have a cognitive decline um what are what are the percentages and what are we seeing lately Okay, well, well, when the earlier studies um, in Canada, the only really good uh, prevalence study of dementia in Canada was done in the early 90s, and they showed that at the age of 100, 50% of people had dementia. At the okay. age of 80, 30% of people had dementia. And, and then, of course, I guess the point I'm trying to make is as the ages get younger, 
fewer people have dementia. And the overall prevalence rates of dementia in Canada at that time were thought to be about 6 to 7%. So not very many people <laughs> over the age of 65 is the point. Um, it does increase in um, you know, prevalence or the number of people who have it as people get higher in age. Um, but the interesting thing, which I find fascinating, is around the world in the past you know, several past five years, prevalence rates of dementia seem to be declining. Despite us thinking because of the aging populations in Western countries, we're seeing prevalence rates declining. And it's a very curious phenomenon and we're not really sure why and not every country is showing it. And Canada hasn't unfortunately repeated that study of dementia prevalence and incidence as well. Um, but we're, well, I'm part of a team that's trying to kind of recreate some of that using um, uh, a couple different methods. So we don't really know if what we look like in Canada relative to the rest of the world. It's very interesting phenomena that there's some hope that people are aging healthier, that some of the things that can make people have dementia um, are kind of getting fixed to some degree that fewer people are getting dementia. Well, and, and could you talk about some of those things? Because sure. you, yeah. you said you talk about physical health as, as connected to, to mental health. So yes, so uh, I'll start with dementia, which is separate <laughs> than, than mental health. I think that was one of your questions at some point. Yeah, um, yeah. so dementia is uh, a, ser a whole bunch of different causes, first of all. So even me saying the word dementia isn't overly descriptive because there's so many different causes of dementia, including Alzheimer's disease. Alzheimer's disease is the most common cause of dementia. Although one could argue that vascular components are probably the most common cause of at least mixed dementias. Um, and uh, dementia refers, it's an umbrella term and it refers to a lot of different things that cause cell death. And as you live longer, the cells in your brain die. There are different disease processes that lead to that. And you have more and more cognitive problems and more and more problems functioning in your daily life without help. So that's kind of the, the core of dementia. Whereas mental health concerns, again, many different causes, many different etiologies, or like the differences in the brain and why they get caused in many different presentations. Um, but mental health concerns, for the most part, are not degenerative. That, that means they don't get worse over time. They're usually cyclical. So you usually have an episode, see a major depressive episode, but then you come out of it and then you might have something else. There are some chronic mental health uh, or mental illnesses, um, but even they tend to be, there's periods where things are worse and periods where things are better. And whereas dementia usually, although there's fluctuations, anyone who's ever worked with anyone, cares anyone living with dementia, there are fluctuations in good days and bad days. There's really no period of returning back to the baseline. Whereas with mental illnesses, you can have that. Not all of them are that clear and not all of them are that simple. I'm thinking about things like schizophrenia, which is a chronic lifelong you know, illness, but there are periods of worsening symptoms with schizophrenia and periods of um, better functioning. Yeah. Right. So that's and, and lots of those things can also be controlled by interventions like medications or yeah. talk therapy or things like that. Am I right? Yeah, so yeah, so I would say that um, there's very few medications that help with dementia, unfortunately. Um, there's only a few approved that we can try and they at most, if we're lucky for some people, stabilize function for a little while. Um, and there are some types of talk therapy that our team is doing actually that can help with people living with dementia function or maximize their function in daily life. So one of them is called cognitive rehabilitation. And that's something that my team offers through um, the Rural Remote Memory Clinic interventions. Um, but talk therapy is very commonly thought of as, as something you do with mental health concerns um, and to improve mental wellness. And talk therapy is very interesting because um, before we had good neuroimaging or ways to look at the brain, 
we didn't know that talk therapy changes the brain because it does. I mean, every thought you have is actually a, a change in your brain. Every time you learn something new, you've made a new connection in your brain and that's changed your brain. So, you know, in some ways it might not be that surprising. So there's ways to change your brain chemistry through taking medications, psychotropic medications, but also talk therapy. And they seem to work in different ways for people. And they're um, sometimes used together. If that answers that. Right, right. Um, and, and one of our, our listeners has, has just asked about what kind of activities you can do, um, perhaps with someone who has some dementia that might stabilize it or keep it better. Are there things that, or we can do ourselves to stave off the onset of some of these things? Yes, so yes, that's a big question. I can talk about that by itself for a whole hour. <laughs> so okay. I'll, I'll, we won't give I'll, you that long. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, put a, I'll put a pin in the what can we do to reduce our risk of dementia because I'd like to tr talk about that. Okay. And the, the good news about that is it's also everything you can do to help cognitive aging. So I think that's, you know, because doesn't matter who you are, you're going to experience changes in your memory, not as efficient with aging. We just, this is a common, we know this. So cognitive aging is, is uh, a fact of life. Um, so I think that's something that could be interesting. But I think the other question was what kind of things could someone, um, what kind of therapies or things could you do with somebody with dementia? And it really, the truthfully, the part of the reason why we do this intervention is because it's so individualized. You have to figure out what their patterns are, what their preference are, what they likes are, what they're, you know, and then design an intervention with, if they have a living caregiver, it's much easier. And you can, you know, usually a spousal caregiver is usually the living one. Um, and you can work together to figure out what fits within their family life and their structures to maximize either like supports to help somebody do new things. Um, or change the environment or routines to help maximize functioning. So that's, it's all very individualized. But some of the things that we can do in that type of intervention is teach people using our knowledge of the way the nervous system is organized. And we can still teach people who have say profound memory problems, how to do some new things. You just have to do it differently and you have to do it a lot. Um, so there are some minor, again, minor things, but it can make a huge difference in a family's life to have some of these things. For instance, if they no longer remember the names of people in their life, for example, uh, mm -hmm. it can make a huge difference to help with that training. Um, memory books can be extremely helpful. So there's a couple of different, but again, it all depends on the person. So uh, it's very labor intensive and it's part of why you don't see it in the health region <laughs> as offered because right not being paid for. Mental health in general is underfunded. Um, let me talk though about what you can do intervention wise to help with cognitive aging and then reduce your risk of cognitive impairment or dementia. Um, and there's several things that you can do. One of them is socialization. So socializing and maintaining social interactions and it doesn't actually, as far as I know, it doesn't matter if you're in person or video conferencing, as long as you're getting that social interaction is good for your brain. And then part of the reason it's good for your brain is because it's good for your mental health, um, but it's also a very cognitively challenging activity. Paying attention to somebody, thinking about what they said and coming up with your response. Like these, it, believe it or not, that is actually a, a very challenging activity and it requires your attention. So there's a couple of things that help with reducing risk of cognitive impairment and one of them is this theoretical thing called cognitive reserve and some of that is like how much education did you get early in life and what did you do for an occupation for most of your life for instance but some of it's things like what do you do do you do activities everybody here is learning something new and listening and of course probably saying she speaks too quickly <laughs> I can't hear her, <laughs> sorry, um, for instance. And that's a cognitively stimulating activity, right? So this is good for your brain right now, learning something new, listening, mm -hmm. to somebody, mm -hmm. hard to listen to. This is good for your brain. So doing kind of mentally challenging things is good for your brain. It helps with cognitive reserve. 
And those things help stave off cognitive aging and other more pathological types of cognitive aging like dementia. So, um, and then there's a whole realm of physical stuff that can help with that too. <laughs> well, well, and that's what, as you're speaking, one of the things I was thinking about, well, that's okay. I'm pretty stimulated these last few months with many Zoom calls with people. Yeah. But what I really miss is touch. I, I, I can't hug people. I can't shake their hand yeah. or hold their hand, those kinds of things. Does that make a difference? You know, I don't know the answer to that one, Jen. <laughs> so, okay. Um, I don't. I suspect it does, but I don't think that, or at least if it's been researched systematically, I don't know of it. In like, we know it's been researched in young children and development. Yes, touch is very critical. Absolutely, we know that. So it makes perfect sense. It would be equally as important on the other end of the aging spectrum. Mm -hmm. I just don't think that it became something we might have thought about until now where we have right now there's all of a sudden got all, this barrier yeah exactly yeah and all interactions have to be done you know remotely and and you're right is is the data so far suggests virtual socialization and cognitively stimulating things is good for you the question is is it as good for you as when you can touch that research i'm not sure has been done Okay, so we might have to just fund a study about hugging one of these days. <laughs> yeah, but we have, I, to have a control group, but which is not allowed to. Who would though, exactly. Be control Who group? deny people those things? Yeah, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah. yeah, you know, and you were talking a, a bit before about the cognitive reserve and things like that. Um, I've I've seen uh, videos and and things of people who are very very far into their dementia, nonverbal, things like that. But music played a large part of their life previously. And they can suddenly remember all the words to songs or even play the piano sometimes when you would think that they just were not computing. How, how does that work? Yeah, so that's an interesting phenomenon about how the nervous system and the memory system is organized. So. Um, there we have a type of memory system that is one that we're not necessarily aware of and it, it's the type that allows you to play a piano or ride a bike. So these kind of um, we call them procedural memories. So you can do a task, even if you can't say that you know how to do it. So you could be profoundly densely amnestic and not be able to say, I can play the piano, but actually go up and play a piano if it's sitting in front of you, for instance. And um, that's because the memory system that allows you to talk about your life or answer questions is separate from this memory system that has all these procedures. And the one that has all these procedures is it's organized in the brain and it's stored where the motor programming is stored. So even for singing, the words to the song are not stored where the normal memories are. They're stored with the motor programming with the singing. So because of that, and because that they're not all going through this one system, the hippocampus, which is so sensitive to damage and so it's important for learning new information or recalling information about your own life, for instance, this other memory system I'm talking about is all through the brain. It's kind of a little bit over here, a little bit over there. It's kind of much more distributed. And because of that, it's really hard to damage it. So you can get damage, of course, in certain aspects of it. And you will see that um, depending on the type of uh, dementia, you will see some motor programming problems, for instance. Um, but, you know, be just because these types of memories are different types of memories, they have different neuroanatomical bases for them, they tend to be spared. And that's actually the knowledge of that is what we use when we do cognitive rehabilitation to train people to do new things. So. Okay, okay. And for anybody who knows me, music is not a big part of my life and I'm very musically challenged. So it's unlikely, no matter how demented <laughs> I become, that I will suddenly play the piano or sing. However, um, there may be, I think what you're saying is there may, I may have other routine kinds of things that I do that are stored in a different part of my yeah. memory. Yeah. So, Absolutely. yeah. And, yeah. and because again, because they're stored around the brain where the motor programming is, it's really hard for a disease process to wipe them out early on. 
Whereas our memories for learning new information or recalling information about our life are all dependent on this cluster of cells and the part of our brain right around our ears over here and the hippocampus, which you might've heard of. And because that structure is so important for all these other types of memories, disrupting that structure on both sides of the brain can really, really make a difference. In mm -hmm. what we do. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, one of our listeners asked a question about, are there any kinds of puzzles or word games or those kinds of things that you could do with someone um, who was starting to decline mentally? Yeah, so, um, so there was a big practice. And so first of all, the quick answer is not that simple. So no, <laughs> the quick answer is okay. um, there was, uh, and you may, I don't have TV, so I don't see these ads, but there's like these kind of puzzle things and luminosity, I believe, and et cetera. Yeah. Um, and there was a lot of push to try and um, make use of those for staving off cognitive aging or dementia. And then uh, research has shown they don't actually help necessarily. Um, mm -hmm. They were based though on research that does help. So it seems that there are a lot of conditions that might be important um, to actually mi mimic what we see in research that shows that these things can make a difference. Um, so it's hard to replicate that in the home environment. So, um, I've got kids at home who are down here for some reason. That's okay. Sorry. Many this of us have the same. The joy so. of being in the pandemic is also having children, you know, who right. are not right. in school physically. Oh. Um, sorry, excuse me. Um, anyway, so, but having said that, um, things that keep your brain active, provided you enjoy it, are likely a good idea, right? It's not going to harm you, but the trials of things that keep your brain active, that if you don't enjoy doing it there's no good evidence to suggest that you should force yourself to do it because it's going to help you if that makes sense right. so it's not like exercise exercise physical activity and exercise force yourself to do that one even if you don't like it because that one is shown time and time that, again that was on my list to ask you yeah. about so yeah. so if i were to go out for a good walk around the block yeah. you would highly recommend that i would do that instead of playing luminosity for sure yeah yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, yeah, absolutely. So, um, physical activity and exercise is the one thing shown time and time again. Don't get me wrong. As I said, these cognitively stimulating activities do help, but they seem to help most in clinical trial settings. Um, so that's the important part about that. So it's not been okay. translated into home environment all that well, but physical activity and exercise has been. Um, time and time again, it's the one thing you can do to reduce cognitive aging and to, uh, if you have mild cognitive impairment and you engage in physical activity and exercise, you're, you delay the onset of dementia. And if you look at a population level, people who have had physical activity and exercise at a population level are less likely to have dementia. Having said that, if you have the disease process in your brain, nothing's going to stop it. So it's, it's not that simple, but population level, some of those fine okay. gradations get. Okay. I, I, I want to I go two routes now. One is um, because you say, if I've got it in my brain, uh, you know, eventually it's, it's going to come. I can't stop it forever. But um, how inheritable are these things? Like you hear lots of times people say, well, we have a lot of, of Alzheimer's in our family. So I expect I'll get it. Right. Is so, that true? Uh, so, yes and no. <laughs> Just my answer for everything. <laughs> Alzheimer's disease is common. And because it's common, it's going to run, it looks like it runs in families, but it might not. It might just be, you know, at 30% of people at the age of 80, for instance, have dementia. Mm -hmm. It's be Alzheimer's, for instance. Um, there, however, there are some types of dementia that are highly genetic. Can you give me a moment? I'm gonna ask them to be, can you hear them? Yeah. Okay. Very, very little, but. Okay, okay, that's fine. That'll, that'll yeah, it's not interesting. <laughs> okay, fine. Um, there are very few types of dementias that run in families, like really clearly run in families. And with Alzheimer's disease, they tend to be the young onset ones. So the ones that hit in the 50s. Just 
Oh, Megan, I lost your, oh, okay. Telling the kids to stop talking, <laughs> sorry. Um, <laughs> yes, yeah, so, um, yeah. I'm now I'm distracted from what I was saying. I also okay. see some questions on the side, so I'm not sure if I'm supposed to be reading those or you are. <laughs> uh, I'm reading most of the, the questions, but yeah, back, back to the inheritance thing then, just because my dad um, had serious dementia doesn't necessarily mean that it's automatic ticket for me. No, no, and there are some, there are some data suggesting certain types of genetic profiles might make people run in the family a bit more. So you may have heard of this thing called the APOE4 allele, for instance. Um, so there are some data suggesting this, but it's not, it's so weak a predictor that they don't recommend genetic testing because it actually doesn't help much. So um, it can be, I will say though, that they, there are some types of dementia clearly run in families and um, the more likely you see them run in families or the more likely you see this genetic component is when they're younger onset. Not okay. all, but more likely. So, you know, you can get dementia. I mean, the youngest person in, in the literature that I've seen, not personally, but in the literature is 17 years old. So these dementia processes are, not, you know, and there are types of dementia that, that hit in your 50s on average. Mm -hmm. so. mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, variability. Yeah. Okay. If we flip over a bit and not just talk about dementia, yeah. Um, yeah. but just exactly. generally about those yeah. of us who are listening today, um, what kinds of things can we do to um, maintain our mental health? We mentioned going out for a walk. What other things, um, first of all, even if you could talk about some of the common mental health challenges that older adults face, um, yeah. and then what we could do. Yeah. The most common mental health challenge is depression. Um, I had stats on that, but it's about 12%, I think, prevalence rates of older adults um, with depression. And then the second most common type of mental health concern is a type of anxiety. And there's many different types of anxieties, but anxiety is a general, we'll just call it anxiety, um, is also uh, fairly common, although it's about maybe 10%, or depending on the study, a bit lower. But you are more likely to see older adults with anxiety if they also have a medical condition. So there's a, um, a link there. And then the other aspect I wanted to talk about, which I think is important and um, is kind of on my take home slide because it's so important, is medical conditions, which are more common as you age, um, can actually cause mental health and cognitive health problems. Um, so I think that's very important. So for any, and we call it a delirium. So, um, and they can be subtle types of, you know, me medical changes that can lead to, to mental health concerns. So it's really important. And this happens more likely for older adults. And you've probably heard them uh, if you've ever, uh, you know, had anyone who's in long-term care or or is having a harder time, but you've probably heard about for females, urinary tract infections are really common. And then you may have heard how it can cause mental health concerns and maybe some confusion, for instance. Um, sometimes it's a bit more subtle than that. And um, um, that can be a, a linking factor is, is the, the problems with med medical issues actually causing changes in your mood uh, increased anxiety and maybe even confusion or cognitive changes. So, mm -hmm. so that's delirium, which is important as well. And and just for, uh, if this would totally be your own opinion, but okay. how attuned are most family practitioners, for example, or even when I'm a patient in hospital and I start to experience some of these things, and it's not necessarily directly related to what I'm being treated for. How tuned in is the system? the health system to to noticing some of these things paying so, attention to them yeah actually so a big part of my work is is working with primary care providers so i do actually have data on this one and um you know obviously the ones we work with are pretty attuned to it but it's quite um surprising how getting an up-to-date full panel blood spectrum isn't necessarily the first step um, in primary care, and really it's, it's one of the first steps to rule out medical causes that could be causing these changes. So I think it's really important if you happen to have a primary care provider, whether that be a physician or nurse practitioner, 
and you go in with a new onset concern, maybe it's your low mood, you have no energy, really, if they're not ordering blood work first, they, they really should be. Um, I th I'd like to say I don't think it's that common, but sadly, I, I still do see people. So when we diagnose people clinically, we, I, won't, I won't make a diagnosis without, without an up-to-date blood panel. Okay. So even if it's a depression, even if it's depression, I send people back or I find out when their last medical evaluation was and if they had a full blood panel, because there are so many physical things that can look like mental health concerns. For instance, low thyroid, you know, you look like you have depression and you have no energy and it's not actually, you know, not that you can, can't have depression and, and hypothyroidism, you can, but let's first get that medical issue treated and, and then worry about the other stuff. So even when I'm making mental health diagnoses, I always, I always get. Okay, and, and for, for those of us listening today, one of the things we can do is be informed ourselves. So when we go yeah. to see the doctor, we know yeah. how to describe our symptoms and also ask, for certain things to be done in order to collaborate with our physicians on finding the yeah. right diagnosis. Yeah, so yeah, so one of the points on my take home slide I was, I was asked to do, which is <laughs> to say if you have any new onset symptom, like even if it's depression or I'm low or I'm feeling really anxious or I'm having changes in my thinking or my memory seems worse, the first thing you need to do is go to your family doctor and ask to get an evaluation. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, the other, the other sort of thing is um, advice to those of us who are quite isolated these days, and it goes mm -hmm. back to a few things you've touched on, but um, you know, we might tend to get a bit obsessed with, I think my memory is going, oh dear, uh, because I don't have a lot of other people around me. I live alone. So I don't have a lot of other people around me to say to me, gee, your memory is getting bad or to notice certain things, anything we should pay attention to about ourselves without getting obsessed about it? It's a good question. Um, so health related anxiety about uh, memory really does increase as you get older. That's because as I said, one of the things we know from cognitive aging is that memory systems are less efficient speed of thinking is slower. There are many changes that happen and we call this normal aging. This is normal, completely expected. Um, so for me, um, the Alzheimer's Society has an ABCs or 10 warning signs of dementia. So certainly if you want to go to the Alzheimer's Society, it's Saskatchewan's website, you can see that. Um, they have, you know, and one of the things I think for me though, that's really important is are these memory problems actually making a difference in your life or are they just nuisances? So I, I think if I were gonna you know, boil everything down to, do you need attention for this or not? Is, is this just a nuisance? Because I mean, I couldn't find my glasses yesterday for the whole day, right? <laughs> you know, yeah. of course the cats yeah. knocked them on the floor, but you know, um, for instance. So like there's things that we all have lapses and these are nuisances and I'm not gonna lie, they do increase in frequency and see as you get older again this is cognitive aging um but if they're impacting your ability to do things uh, maybe you're forgetting to pay bills for instance or other things then i think it's probably a good idea to get help the challenge can be is sometimes frequently i hear from people that um they get dismissed by their primary care provider and oh no no this you're just getting older it's not a big deal but if you continue to be worried about it then um, one of the other things um, I started uh, with some research funding is a self-referral clinic that doesn't require a physician referral to get your memory assessed. Yeah, so, so um, I guess I'll have to find a way to get you guys that website link, but that's one of the things um, in part because I've heard too many times through my clinical work how people have such a hard time convincing their primary care provider to send them to a specialist. So mm -hmm. I also work in that specialty clinic, um, but I made a new clinic um, from some grant money based on the stories I've heard from people where they get, keep, they're getting dismissed all the time. And I think if it's worrying you that much and it's impacting your life, then maybe, you know, then maybe, maybe what you need help with is something else. 
frequently um, what I see are people who are really worried about their cognition and I come in and we assess them and they look fine, um, which is great, good news, wonderful news, love to give that news. Um, but they actually have problems with sleep. Sleep problems are so common. So I, I also wanted to bring that up because <laughs> mm -hmm. insomnia okay. is, is, and you know, the, the treatment, the frontline treatment for insomnia is not going to your primary care provider and getting some pills or sleeping pills. Actually, the frontline treatment for insomnia because of the research on it is actually psychological therapy, talk therapy, believe it or not, is the frontline treatment for insomnia. And it goes beyond just these things like sleep hygiene and doing all this. It's, it's a type of therapy that you have to make changes in the way you act during the day and the things you do and the changes in your behavior at night that can make a big difference in, in, um, in how well you sleep because not sleeping well impacts cognition and mood. So I think that's the other thing if I have you know, to uh, talk about um, is that uh, many people think, oh, I'm getting older, so sleep is harder. In fact, actually, you know, you may have some shifts in when you want to sleep and the phases of sleep as people get older. But insomnia is not, not something older people have to struggle through. And, um, and I think that um, getting treatment for insomnia is pretty important. And it's hard to get that psychological treatment. Mm -hmm. um, my team offers it for caregivers and people living with dementia. That's one of the projects that we have some research funding to look at how well that works. But there's also some resources at the University of Saskatchewan. Uh, the medication assessment unit, for instance, does uh, treatment for insomnia and maybe other resources that I don't know about. Yeah. 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 And one I'll of our much. Says, what about people who sleep too much? Yeah, so sleeping too much um, could be a couple of different things. And I would, again, start going, going to your primary care provider and getting an up-to-date plug panel because it could be hypothyroidism, it could be anemia. Um, and it could be, you know, something else, but it could also be that you're not sleeping necessarily well at night. So you're sleeping during the day because you have to. Um, but there's many different reasons for sleeping too much. And I'd start with the medical mm -hmm. assessment. And I do see that sleeping too much is a feature of some of the conditions that I work with as well. Right, right. And, and sleep apnea mentioned by someone too is another thing yeah. you might get picked out. Yes, so, so okay. sleep apnea. Yeah, so um, people who have sleep apnea, definitely, sorry, I'm, I'm just- That's okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, sleep apnea is um, very treatable. It's just not a treatment most people like. And we don't do CBT, we don't do our, our, our um, psychological treatment for insomnia if somebody has untreated apnea. But if they have treated apnea and they're still having insomnia, we can see it can be done. But tr yeah, treating apnea is pretty important. And one of the things that we do is before we even start an intervention for sleep treatment is, is we try and rule out um, screen for apnea because I think it's really important. Okay, yeah. okay. And, and again, a talk, I could give a whole talk on this too, is um, you know, disturbed sleep and apnea, these, these actually increase our risk of dementia. In fact, Alzheimer's disease. And okay. Those are, those are really new data, yeah. Okay. And someone having seen your cat go yeah. through has yeah. just said about is having a pet one of the, the things yeah. that, that also helps. Yes, in fact, it is. Um, and one of my PhD students, that's what her dissertation is going to be on, believe it or not, is, um, you know, using pets, um, having pets, and how they interact with um, mental health, mental wellness, and cognitive aging. So, so I've, she's got that passion for that. Um, and maybe, maybe when she's ready to start trying some interventions or something, we'll we'll be coming back to SCOA. We're not sure. We were just thinking of working with people with dementia, but we'll see. Okay. Um, if we, we do okay. if we do yeah. aging. Yeah. Not. But yeah, no pets are pets are a socialization. They're cognitively stimulating to some degree. Okay. And, and, and let's go hug. Yeah, and let's go back around to that because we started out and you were talking a lot about the importance of social engagement. Anything else you want to talk about that? Having friends, having the kind of stimulation yeah. we're having today. 
Yeah, so cognitively stimulating, I think mostly we've been talking about socialization in that regard. Um, socialization is also important, but it seems really interesting that it's not just any socialization that really helps with, with even, believe it or not, cognitive aging. So um, I've been lucky enough to be on some teams that have looked at these data coming out of the Canadian Longitudinal Study on Aging, which is like a study of 50,000 Canadians for 20 years. So we're getting some really good data. And it seems having people in your life who you emotionally can rely on is not only good for your mental health, it's also good for your cognitive health. So getting socialization and having a specific type is, is somebody who you feel is emotionally there for you, as opposed to a group of strangers seems to be the most important part. And, you know, um, there's a bunch of literature on how socialization as a general construct um, increases physical health and increases, you know, uh, mental health and it increases cognitive health too, which is very interesting. So, but these are, this is a newer area. So we're still kind of understanding it. Okay. Yeah. We know it's important. We know it's, we've always known it's important for mental health, for sure. Right, right. We did ask you to bring along um, just some of the key messages you want us to remember. We got to get to those very shortly, but I have two questions and maybe, maybe they're harder to answer. One, they seem random, but one was somebody had asked about the connection of alcohol or alcoholism and mental health. If you could just touch on that. And the other one, totally out of the blue, but you're a psychologist, a neuropsychologist. Um, what's the difference between you and a psychiatrist? Oh, yes. Okay. So, the, the, so well, I'll start with that one because you have someone second. Um, first of all, so I don't have a medical degree. Psycho psychiatrists have medical degrees. So I, we probably have the similar, well, yes, similar number of years in school. Um, but um, I didn't start with a medical degree. I have an, a graduate degree in psychology and all of my training was pre-doctoral, whereas for um, psychiatrists or any specialist in medicine, they get their MD first and then they go on and specialize postdoctorally. So a, a few differences in the training. But because I don't start with a medical degree, I don't prescribe drugs and right. I can't order blood panels and interpret them myself. So I have to work with physicians, primary care providers, nurse practitioners to do that for me um, because I can't, because I don't have that medical degree to begin with. So I'd say that's probably the main difference. And, and because we don't prescribe, now most psychologists don't prescribe drugs. There are some states where psychologists can go get the medical training they need to, and they can prescribe psychotropic drugs. So drugs for depression or anxiety or schizophrenia yeah. or bipolar, for instance. Um, but that's pretty limited. In Canada, we haven't really expressed an interest in doing that and having us prescribe drugs. So, okay. Yeah. Okay. So that's a big difference. Yeah. Right. And, and then the other, other question, left, uh, left out of left field was alcohol. And, right. And yeah. Which is a, a great one, actually, because it's, <laughs> it seems to be on the rise in the pandemic. So it's also interesting because I'm seeing a lot of people uh, in the past five years coming to me in the memory clinic who increased their drinking because their primary care provider told them it was healthy for them. So it's been very interesting, uh, alcohol. So for the longest time, I think, first we thought alcohol was bad, and then there was data coming out suggesting maybe it actually is neuroprotective, but those data were really contradictory. And we, you know, but they always made the news media because everybody wanted to hear that, you know, a glass of wine a day is good for you. So, um, but it turns out it looks like that might be a little too optimistic. And in all likelihood, alcohol is not that protective for us. And they, particularly those epidemiological large scale studies, um, it might be if there was a protection for some people, it might have been cardiovascular and based only if they had poor diet. So it was very complicated. Okay. So, okay. Yeah. So alcohol, you know, and too much alcohol at lunch. So what's called binge drinking actually causes damage to your brain. Okay. So yeah. So it can accelerate cognitive aging and we don't necessarily call alcohol. We don't use in North America, we don't refer to alcohol related dementia, but you can get, it adds to the kind of factors that can lead to dementia. And of course, 
a very extreme cases of um, use of alcohol without proper nutrition can lead to a very acute, if you survive it, you'll have a very profound cognitive impairment type challenge. So alcohol is actually not that benign, believe it or not. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, and I, I apologize, I could talk to you all afternoon about this, <laughs> and I'm sure uh, those who are participating feel the same way. But we did ask you to bring a couple of final messages you wanted to leave with us. Right. You want to put those quickly up on the screen and I'm sorry, I've left you like four minutes, three minutes. <laughs> oh, wrong one. There we go. After all that, I, I always have to laugh that I'm not the one who's most tech savvy, right? <laughs> okay. There we go. Sorry. Okay, it came so up mostly, and then it... Yeah, so mostly what I wanted to say was, um, one, if you have any new onset problems, um, get to your physician first, right? Okay. So that's the big thing is, is any new onset, even a mental health concern, um, like new onset depression, for instance, go see your physician because this is potentially a physical problem, not a psychological problem. So I tend to always think everything's in my head because I'm a psychologist. So me and my physician have agreed that I'm not allowed to do that anymore when he gets to diagnose me <laughs> with something. Oops. Um, okay. So that's that. So new onset mental health problems start with your primary care provider. I also wanted to share, you know, if you're having mental health uh, concerns, and I talked about mental health problems that impact your ability to, to engage in life. Um, there's a number here, which is mental health intake, and you can call and refer yourself. Um, I'm not going to promise you that you're not going to be on a big long wait list, but they do triage. So if you have concerns that are really urgent, you will see someone faster. So I think that's important. Mental health services are so underserviced. There's very few mm -hmm. places to go. I, I won't, I won't lie. But one of the things we have in Saskatchewan, which I think is really exciting, is we have an online therapy um, unit and it doesn't cost very much money to engage with and it's out of Regina so because of, you may not know this but um, all healthcare services are regulated provincially so the fact that this is in Saskatchewan even though it's in Regina means you can access it and you all obviously have computer access so this is an online therapy and they have different programs including one for alcohol use actually so um i have the link here but if you google online if you google online therapy user then you can find their website and you can you can see if you're eligible to uh, you know do one of their programs right um the other thing which, which actually is part of why i'm doing this talk is um one of the things that we've been doing in addition to trying to um, support people to use technology and to engage in social connections is also we've been um we have mental health tracking project where clinical psychology trainees would call you ask you some questions and our schedule that works for you whether that's weekly or, or twice a month or monthly whatever you feel comfortable with and track your mental health so we're kind of doing this because of the pandemic and more importantly our goal is to if we see somebody whose mental health seems to be kind of declining is to try and get them engaged with services and supports early and maybe also for people to understand okay wow my mental health has really gone down what else has changed in my life during this period and to kind of look at these contextual factors including sleep so sleep's a, a really big one and i'll talk about that again sleep problems look like they precede the onset of uh, mental health problems um, they used to think for a long time sleep problems were a consequence of depression and don't get me wrong they really are but it also looks like they proceed or they come before the major depression depressive episode. So kind of doing some of those really basic self care um, things like making sure you get enough sleep diets also is important. Uh, the research on diet is less good quality because it's really hard to measure diet, you actually have to measure the microbiome, which is not that easy. Um, so, you know, and physical activity and exercise, physical activity and exercise helps your cognitive health. And I think I talked about that. It also helps depression and anxiety. It helps depression and anxiety so much so that in the UK, 
um, the National Health Service uh, prescribes physical activity to mm -hmm. help with mental health concerns. Right. So I, I'm not going to say that if you have a mental health dis like illness, that that's enough for you. No, I think you should also call mental health intake and get some support or try the online therapy program. Um, but if you're experiencing kind of low mood and maybe engaging in physical activity and exercise that's safe for you is going to actually help. And it also helps with anxiety. It's really, it, it helps with glucose control. It helps with, you know, anxiety. It helps with depression. And it seems to be this one thing that kind of helps with so many things. And if you haven't watched it, I would recommend watching 23 and a half hours um, and it's a nice little kind of educational um, film about the importance of physical activity for kind of many things, including cardiovascular health, which probably doesn't surprise you. Um, but it's a great little video and trying to suggest trying to be sedentary only for 23 and a half hours out of 24 hours in a day. So if that helps you remember the, the name of the, the video, which is very popular, it's got lots of uh, Okay, we'll we'll make sure that that one's on our website yeah. too. It's a great video, yeah, yeah. Okay, all right. Well, I'm going to have to draw it to a close, and I'm I, I apologize because I would I have got a bunch of other questions I'd like to ask you, but do so much appreciate you and your cat taking time to be with us today, uh, and uh, thank you, Megan. Um, you are a true partner of SCOA and uh, someone that I I think. Um, today it has really helped um, lots of the people who are listening just to get a better handle on mental health, what it's all about, and some of the things they can do. So thank you so much. It's been very enjoyable. And I'll turn it back to June just for a few concluding things. Thank you. Well, thanks, Shan. And thank you, Megan. It was really a good session that we had today. I wanted to let everybody know that our next coffee break session will be held on March the 10th. And it's what pharmacists can do for you. And March 25th is things to consider when renting. So for more information about these and other webinars, just go to our homepage, www.scoa.ca. If you could stay online just for a moment after the webinar closes, two questions will pop up. And there's a survey that helps us to determine what to offer next. And if you stay on to do that, we'll enter your name in a draw for a $25 gift certificate. So thanks everybody for attending.